Good morning, and the Lord be with you. First Presbyterian Church wishes to welcome all of you to worship today. Um, if you're visiting with us today, we're so glad that you're here, and we would ask that you fill out a visitor's card. I believe they're orange. Um, it's in the back of the pew, and put it in the offering plate later in the service. Also, if you would have an have a prayer request this morning, please fill that out um, there in the back of the, of the pew as well, and place them in the offering plate and we will pass those on to Reverend Johnson. Speaking of which, it's nice to have Reverend Gordon Johnson back with us this morning. Um, it's made the, made the trip down from London and a beautiful morning this time, and we're so glad that he's here and looking forward to the message that he will be bringing this morning. And just Steve is on, and his family are on vacation. They were over in Indianapolis went to the Children's Museum and a bunch of other places over there with some good friends. So they were having a, 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 a nice, least nice, probably not leisurely weekend, probably a nice weekend away from, from, from home. Um, so we're, we're, and that's always a good thing too. Um, we have some announcements, so I'll let these two lovely ladies make their announcements and then I have a couple. Good morning. So, um, last Tuesday was the start of our Soup and a Movie with our friends over at um, All Saints, <laughs> sorry, All Saints, and um, we had some conflicting um, other things going on in the community, so we know that, you know, that's why we didn't have quite as many there, but we're really hoping to see a lot of you um, there Tuesday evening, or here Tuesday evening, down in Persinger Hall. Um, the movie is movie is Joan of Arcadia. If you've never seen the show, it's really good. Um, so we hope that a lot of you will come. It's All Saints' turn to make and bring soup, and we have the go withs and the desserts. So it should be a, a good evening all the way around. So 5:30 on Tuesday. Make sure you mark your calendars. Um, the other thing I know, uh, 
since Gary Campbell is not here today, um, I, I wanted to put the word out that he is already planning to do his magic for our Easter sunrise breakfast and uh, has put together a list of items that we could use to help uh, put together that breakfast for donations. So if you can look out in the uh, entryway as you're leaving today and perhaps sign up for some of those items or one or two of those items, that would be greatly appreciated. Easter will be here very soon. Thank you and hope to see you Tuesday. Well, this is the last time you'll have to hear this announcement because this coming Saturday is our springtime at Luigi's dinner. Um, there are still tickets available if you haven't gotten tickets. If you're watching online and you would like tickets, um, please call me since the church office will be closed tomorrow. Um, also, if you want tickets and you forgot to bring money, just let me know and I will trust you with that. We'll make your reservation. I just need to know how many we're going to prepare for. If you can't come and you would still like to make a donation, remember all of our money is going to Pelotonia and 100% of that goes for cancer research. So keep that in mind. Um, also, I think, wait, I see a guest in the back. Oh, Yay! wonderful spring evening uh, and we'll have a lot of fun no matter what the weather is just wanted to invite you to come it's going to be a super meal it's going to be a very special meal I think you all will enjoy it a lot it's a little different than what Luigi done but I upscaled it <coughs> you know you gotta be ready to change speaking of change you ain't changed a bit <laughs> are you not, are you a hundred yet Yes. Okay, I know. <laughs> you haven't changed a bit. And there, Mr. Jeff, he's still going to be our MC. He's not going to drink so much this year. <laughs> <laughs> no wine till after you do your thing. <laughs> but we're going to have a lot of fun. But we want to, we make a lot of fun, we make a lot of jokes, but the main thing is we want to raise money for cancer research. Cancer has affected a lot of people in this church. A lot of people have had Wonderful experiences with success rates. Some have not had the success rate. But we have to work on always to keep in mind we got to find a cure for this terrible disease that affects so many people. So, see you all Saturday night. What time does it start? 6 o'clock, dinner at 6.30, but you want to come at 6 o'clock for hors d'oeuvres. Oh, are we going to have hors d'oeuvres? Oh, we got, you, you're not going to believe how fancy this is. So guys, if you messed up on Valentine's Day, you can make it up for now, okay? See you then. Also, we have lots of wonderful items for the raffle and the auction, so bring a little extra money. Thank you so much for everybody that's helped and for all the tickets we've sold. And two more real quick announcements. Um, speaking of, of a meal on Tuesday, the lunch group, the Tuesday lunch group is meeting this Tuesday um, at Roosters this time as we kind of wander around the community at different restaurants. If you want, if you would like to do that, there's a sign up sheet back by the bullet. Oh, Ray Jean's pointing. It's back on the 
on the rack. It's a yellow sheet back in the back corner back here. It's just kind of to give the give them an idea. Roosters has a lot of seating, but give them an idea how many people are, they might need to set up for. And then if you're ordering Easter flowers, um, that's on the stand back there with the bulletins also, back in the same place. Instead of stuffing them in everybody's, in um, all of the um, bulletins this morning, you know, if you want to order flowers, just pick one up on your way out. And those need to be back, as it says on the thing, by Wednesday, March the 29th. There's no other announcements. Um, a lot of things happening around here. Please take a moment to pass to share the love and peace of Christ with your brothers and sisters sitting around you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, as we enter this time of worship, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me in our call to worship, taken from Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 5. The Lord God, who created you, says, Do not be afraid. I know you by name. You are my beloved. Our help is in the name of the Lord. When you go through troubling waters, I will be with you. Our help is in the name of the Lord. When you pass through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. Our help is in the name of the Lord. When you walk through fires of oppression, you will not be consumed. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Do not be afraid. You are precious to me, and I am with you always. In you, O oh Lord, do we trust. Let us join together in our opening hymn, number 463, How Firm a Foundation.
please join me in our call to confession. How do we know when our actions are right? When the fruits of our labors are good and true. Christ is the light that exposes all that we keep hidden, but offers us healing and renewal instead of judgment. Therefore, let us hold up our sins to Christ's gaze. Join me in our prayer to confession. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with relevant and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen.
Good morning. Hello. Um, I'm talking about one great hour of sharing, and if you'll notice in your bulletin, there's a flyer that goes along with what I'm going to talk about. Um, the theme today is We Are There. Uh, during one great hour of sharing, we hear the call to Isaiah 58 to become repairers of the breach, restorers of the streets we live in. During this Lenten season, we have heard stories of empowered and empowering women tenacious and faithful women, binding their families and communities together in strength. In every time and in every place, women usually filled the roles as leaders, quietly, diligently, persistently. If we all would stop for a moment to think about the women we know in our families, in our communities, and right here in our church, we know this to be true. It isn't easy, and as the saying goes, it takes a village. Our village is there to encourage women like Lupe, one of the thousands of farm workers in Florida's tomato fields whose lives are made better thanks to the coalition of Immokalee workers. As a partner of the Presbyterian Hunger Program, the coalition receives support through gifts from one great hour sharing from people like us and the congregation just like ours. We are there. With our gifts, we are part of Lupe's village. We are there with the Dalit women of India. Dalit literally means oppressed and or broken. Smitha is one of the, those that is faced with the hardships and unimaginable following India's last tsunami. But now her family has a more hopeful future thanks to a grant from the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance to the Society for the National Integration through Rural Development, made possible by gifts to one great hour of sharing. They provide new shelters and sewing machines for the community's livelihood. With our gifts, we are part of Smith's Village. We are there with Paola and the other women in Panama City through a partnership with the Women's Meeting Space, a non-governmental organization that or advocates for the rights of Panama's women through indigenous and its poorest communities. They receive a grant through self-development of people supported by our gifts to one great hour of sharing and started an experimental nursery and installed a community farm with the goal of not only feeding the growers' families, but selling surplus food to cover the basic needs of workers. With our gifts, we are part of Paola's village. We are there. Our work is informed by our belief that the church is not an institution, but an action. For the church to be the church, it must take action to those in need. For over 70 years, one great hour of sharing has provided a way to share God's love with our neighbors in need around the world. Please give what you can, as they always say, when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. Restoring God, you have called us to repair what in this world you love so much that has been broken. May the repairs made through our gifts bring life to communities in need and bring praise to your holy name. Amen.
Hello, guys. How are you doing today? Good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so today you're going to be hearing with the scripture um, in Matthew. Basically, it's the story of when Jesus walks on the water. And I know that you've heard that story, but I want to just point out a couple of things to keep in mind this week. So when we're looking at the scripture, there's two times that someone is afraid either it's the disciples as a whole or it's peter by himself as he's on the water he is afraid so something that the scripture says is that immediately jesus calmed them either by saying don't be afraid or reaching out and grabbing peter's hand when he's on the water with him but what i wanted to point out to you was the word immediately that even though that there might be things going on at school or maybe you see something on television that frightens you, it's not God's will or purpose for you to be afraid. And he doesn't want you to feel that way ever. Just like your parents, they don't, they don't want you to be afraid. They want to help you. Jesus wants to help you too. That word immediately, um, really got my attention because it's not his intent for you to be afraid. And it's not his intent for you to go through these things alone. But I do want to point out one thing that the disciples that were with him, they were afraid. But Peter was brave enough to challenge it by saying that if it is you please ask me to come with you if if you're afraid it's very hard to focus on above the fear and um have any of your parents seen the shack have they told you that they've watched that movie the shack no okay well it's a little mature for you guys but if your parents have seen the shack there's a scene where um Mac is out on the water and he's being consumed with what looks like oil, but it's meant to show fear and all the bad things that have happened in his life. But the man who portrays Jesus says, look at me. This is not, this is not from me. Look at me. And he focuses on the man who is portraying Christ and he does an excellent job. But anyway, um, Jesus tells him, look at me. None of this stuff is me. Just just be calm and, and look into my face and you'll find relief. So um, just wanted to point that out to you guys, that if something is going on in your life, you don't have to deal with it by yourself. And immediately it can be fixed if you're brave enough like Peter to ask for it. Okay? So Jesus doesn't want you to be afraid. He doesn't want you to go through stuff by yourself. Talk to him and talk to him quickly so you don't have to mess with it anymore okay let's have a prayer real quick dearest jesus i thank you for these kids in front of me i thank you for the kids who are here thank you for their parents for bringing them to hear your word please help them not to be afraid if they do have oil or troublesome things in their lives that are weighing them down like Mac. Please help them to look to you immediately and to focus on you and realize this is not from you. And I ask this in your dearest name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So today, loves, you're doing the sensibility, and it looks like Miss Deborah is going to help you with that. So um, you're going to want to come up and get a bucket from her, and she will help you. Thank you, sweeties. <coughs>
Okay. Um, please join with me in our first scripture reading, Psalm 23. Uh, the words will be up on the screen. I'll start and then you follow. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson for this morning is from Matthew's gospel, the 14th chapter, uh, beginning at the 22nd verse. Listen for the word of God. Immediately after Jesus had fed 5,000 people, he made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead on the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. During my teenage years in Toledo, our church's youth group went downtown to Skid Row on Cherry Street and visited the Salvation Army's rescue mission. Walking through the front door of the mission, we were confronted by a huge mural painting that depicted this scene that Matthew uh, pictures for us in the gospel lesson for today. The picture was of a very frightened Peter, sinking halfway beneath the billowing waves of the sea, a very angry sea, and Christ was stretching out his hand to save him. Wow, I thought to myself, what an appropriate painting uh, for a rescue mission. It became even more appropriate when the captain of the Salvation Army, who was showing us around through the mission station, pointed out that the painting had really been painted by a man who had been saved in the rescue mission. Christ had reached out his hand to this man and had saved him from an angry sea of drunkenness, debauchery, and near death. And the man had painted that wall as a token of his gratitude to Christ. In our lesson, immediately after Jesus had fed some 5,000 men, plus 
all the women and the children, so it could have been a crowd of over 10,000 people. After he had fed 10,000 with just five loaves and two small fish, the crowd, uh, stirred up by this miraculous event, wanted to take Jesus by force and make him their king, their leader. With such a miracle leader as this, a man who could feed 5,000 or 10,000 with just five loaves of bread and a few fish, with him as their leader, why they could drive out the hated Roman Empire and restore freedom to their kingdom of Israel. But Jesus would have none of that. Instead, Matthew tells us, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go across the lake. Then, instead of leading a a band of revolutionaries against Rome, he dismissed the crowds to go home, and he went up a nearby mountain to pray. And when evening came, says Matthew, he was there alone. Jesus was such a very busy individual, constantly going about doing good for others during his three short years of ministry, that he often had to set aside some time and choose to take that time to be alone with God in prayer. Now, we Christians down across the centuries have been very diligent about repeating that prayer which Jesus taught his early disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. But have we been as diligent in deliberately choosing special times to be alone with God in prayer? Jesus, that great minister of human need, often climbed the solitary hills to quench his spiritual thirst at the ever-flowing fountain of prayer and to renew his strength and his courage for the events and the tasks ahead. As Jesus climbed the mountain that night, I, I wonder whether he might have repeated to himself the words of the psalmist, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. If Jesus needed such times to be alone with God in prayer, to renew his body, his mind, his spirit, how much greater is your need and my need? Richard Trench, the renowned poet of the 19th century, Uh, explains it or expresses it this way. Lord, what a change within us. One short hour spent in thy presence will prevail to make. What heavy burdens from our bosoms take. What parched ground refreshes with a shower. We kneel how weak. We rise how full of power. Why therefore should we do ourselves this wrong or others that we are not always strong, that we should ever weak or anxious be, troubled when with us is prayer and joy and strength and courage are with thee. While Jesus was up on the mountain praying that night, his disciples were far out on the lake struggling with a storm in the night. The Sea of Life, just like the Sea of Galilee, is often subject to storms, angry winds and waves, all sorts of troubling incidents. The disciples had not really wanted to get in that boat and go across the lake. Matthew tells us Jesus made them made them get into the boat. He is putting them in a position where they're going to have to battle some angry waves during the night hours. They're going to face contrary winds and billowing waves. Just because you and I are followers of Jesus Christ does not mean that we have the right to expect that the winds and the waves of life will always be favorable. 
for us. God, you recall, sent a very angry wind and wave against Jonah, who was disobeying God. But here, here, the disciples are simply doing what Jesus made them do, get in a boat. They were obeying. The winds and the storms of life come and go. Just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean we're exempt from the storms. When I was pre-teenage, I had my first taste of death. My beloved aunt, Princess, and that was actually her name, Princess. She was my younger sister, and she lived like she was the princess of the house. But Aunt Princess, after whom my sister was named, Aunt Princess, uh, in the early 40s, was told by the doctor she had cancer. And back in the 40s, cancer was a death sentence. It was automatic. No one escaped it. We knew she was going to die. And she lingered on in unbelievable suffering until she died about nine months later. And I could never understand that as a little boy, why God would allow such a holy person as my aunt to suffer and die like that. When she died, her caregiver gave the family a poem that she had by the side of her bed. And she insisted that that poem be read to her every night before she fell asleep. It was a take on the 23rd Psalm. It goes like this. He leadeth me in pastures green. No, not always so. Sometimes he who knoweth best in kindness leadeth me in weary ways where heavy shadows be. Out of the sunshine, warm and soft and bright, out of the sunshine into darkest night, I oft would yield to sorrow and to fright. Only for this, I know he holds my hand. So whether led in green or desert land, I trust, although I cannot understand. He leadeth me beside still waters. No, not always so. Oft times the heavy tempests round me blow, and o'er my soul the waves and billows go. But when the storm beats wildest and I cry aloud for help, the master standeth by and whispers to my soul, Lo, it is I. Above the tempest wild I hear him say, Beyond the darkness lies the perfect day in every path of thine. I led the way. So, whether on the hilltops high and fair I dwell, or in the sunless valleys where the shadows lie, what matter, he is there. And more than this, he gives to me no helpless, broken reed, but his own hand, sufficient for my need. So where he leads me, I can safely go. And in the blessed hereafter I shall know why in his wisdom he hath led me so. Three of the four gospel writers all tell this story about Jesus on the lake. Mark, in his story, tells us that, and he's the only one that says this, tells us that Jesus saw his disciples straining at the oars against the billowing waves from his mountaintop altar of prayer. Jesus could see the flashing lightning, he could see the waves beating against their little boat, and he could see the disciples struggling to get to shore. He was watching over them. Never once did they get beyond the range of his watchful eye. But the disciples, they didn't know that. They didn't know that Jesus was watching over them. Perhaps they even feared that Jesus had forgotten all about them. I can can almost imagine impulsive Peter saying, 
Doesn't the master know we're about to perish? Or melancholy Thomas saying, well, it's no use struggling anymore. It's all over for us. Now, this is a miracle story. But every miracle story in the Bible is also a parable, which has many lessons for us. By Jesus' long delay in coming to the disciples that night, and then coming at last, coming at last to them in their need, he had taught them that even though they may have given up on him, he had never forgotten about them. They may be beaten by the billowing waves, but from his mountaintop advantage, he sees, he knows, and he cares. Oh, how we human beings crave to be known by God and cared about by God. There's a very interesting true story out of the Civil War during the lull between the charges in the Second Battle of Cold Harbor, the only battle that General Grant said he was disappointed in, in fighting, they lost so many Union soldiers. The soldiers, officers, the Union soldiers, officers, rode through the ranks of the soldiers before the, bath, the second charge. And they noticed the Union soldiers sitting in the grass and in the thickets, sewing the names, their names, on their coat sleeves. Why were they doing that? Because they expected to die in the next charge. And they shrank from the idea that they would be buried in a nameless grave they wanted somebody back home to know where they had died and how and where they were buried. Ah, yes, the human heart wants to know, is there any eye that sees, any ear that hears my troubles? Does anyone know? Does anyone really care? Well, the Christian faith has an answer to that. In the words of Peter himself in his first epistle, he says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And these words, of course, gave birth to that old gospel hymn we used to sing. It was written back in the early 1900s. Does Jesus care? When my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear. And as the daylight fades in the deep dark shade, into deep dark shades, does he care enough to be near? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know. My Savior cares. Amid the stormy seas of life, Christ keeps watch, keeps watch above his own. The Gospel writer Mark then tells us, when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and Jesus was alone on the mountain, and when Jesus saw that the disciples were struggling at the oars against an adverse wind, he came. He came to them. There in the beautiful words of Mark is the assurance that Christ not only sees and knows and cares, but he comes. He comes to us in our needs. Somewhere between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning, that eerie time when human alertness is at its lowest, Jesus comes walking on the water toward his disciples. And when the disciples foresee him, they are t 
terrified. And they start screaming, look, it's a ghost. (laughs) In addition to the raging storm and the dark, frightening night, now is added the terror of the supernatural. A ghost is coming for them. But immediately Jesus cries out to them and he says, Courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And when they hear his familiar voice, they know all is well. Jesus is that voice that speaks through the howling winds and billowing waves and dark nights of our lives reassuring us that there is more than blind force and energy at work in the world. There is divine love planning and working for us in our lives. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. You trust God. Trust me also. Courage, he says, to his disciples, courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now comes the dramatic incident about Peter that's recorded only by Matthew, not by Luke or Mark. When Peter realizes that it is Jesus coming to them on the water, all his fears and doubts vanish, and in a triumphant spirit he cries out, Lord, if it is really you, then bid me to come to you on the water. Now, it's not as if Peter doubts that it is really Christ coming up to him on the water, but it's as if Peter were saying, because it is you and because you have the power, tell me to come walking on the water also to you. If for no other reason... Peter is always listed first among all the disciples. He is listed first because Peter always was an individual that could tell you about the person and the power of Christ. True. Peter Peter was fearful, but he did not doubt that Jesus had the power to enable him to even walk on water in the midst of a storm. Peter failed in his first attempt, as we shall see. But the great thing about Peter is, at least he tried. He tried. Far better an effort that fails than a cool, cold, calculating attitude that is afraid to take any chances whatsoever. In answer to Peter's request, Jesus says to him simply, come. And without second's hesitation, Peter characteristically just jumps out of the boat and he starts walking on the water to Jesus. For a little while, it goes well as was pointed out in the children's sermon this morning, as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he actually does walk on water. But when he is distracted and looks away and notices the billowing waves, the angry sea, he becomes frightened and he begins to sink. And he cries out, save me, Lord, save me. A great many things happen when we become fearful, when we are afraid. Fear stifles our thinking and our actions, paralyzes our courage, blots out all our goals. How many times Jesus said to his disciples, fear not, be of courage, be good courage. Some Bible student has actually made a study of the Bible and claims that phrases like take heart, be not afraid, let not your hearts be troubled, phrases like that, this student of the Bible says, occur 365 times in the Bible. 
as one for every day of the year. When we fear and we're afraid to put our faith into action, we begin to sink. Now, when Peter cried out in fear, save me, Lord, save me, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him and saved him from going under completely. Anyone here this morning sinking? Sinking beneath some billowing waves of life? Sinking into some deep, dark waters of discouragement, defeat, doubt, despair, depression, sinking beneath some billowing waves of suffering, sorrow, sin? If so, then do what Peter did. Peter has a quick, short prayer for you and me. Save me, Lord. Save me. And Matthew says immediately Jesus reached out his hand and saved him, caught him. And that hand, that hand has never lost its saving power. In August of 1932, there was an African-American jazz musician who also composed and sang gospel songs living in Chicago. He and his wife, Nettie, were expecting, joyously expecting their first child. It was Thomas Dorsey and Nettie Dorsey. Reluctantly, he had to leave her behind while he drove some 300 miles down Route 66 to St. Louis because he had been invited to be the guest soloist there at a huge Baptist revival meeting. That night at the revival meeting, he was asked to sing gospel song after gospel song, one right after another. Finally, he took a break and sat down. When he sat down, the head usher came up to him and handed him a telegram. And the telegram had only four words in it. Your wife just died. He was devastated. A friend of his drove him the 300 miles back during the night to south side of Chicago. When he got there, he learned that his wife, his beloved wife, Nettie, of 25 years of age, had died giving childbirth to a baby boy. But that bit of hope was dashed to pieces the next day when he died, too. After Thomas Dorsey buried his wife and his son in the same casket, he said this, I fell apart. For days I clothed my, closeted myself. I felt that God had done me a, an injustice. I didn't want to serve him anymore or write or sing any gospel songs. I wanted to go back to the old jazz world I once knew so well. After a few days wallowing in the depths, a friend of his picked him up, drove him to the neighborhood music school, took him inside, set him down in an empty room with a piano and left him there. Dorsey said, I sat there for what seemed to be like hours, and then something happened to me. My fingers began to browse over the keys, and I started playing a tune I can't ever remember hearing before. And words came to me. They just came to me. They all fell into place with the music. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. I am tired. I'm weak. I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me on 
lead me home. I invite you to sing that prayer with me, that beloved blues style hymn of faith, gospel hymn, Precious Lord, hymn number 834. Be seated. With gratitude for God's faithfulness and with thanksgiving for all that we have received, let us bring our gifts to God. Would the ushers please come forward?
join me in our unison prayer of dedication. The Lord Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We pray that we find our treasure in you and that our heart truly follows. May this offering and our discipleship journey reveal our love for you. Amen. Please be seated. Let us lift our hearts to God in prayer. Gracious God, it is time to pray. And in the silence of this moment, we ask ourselves, what shall we say when we pray to you? For truly you know us better than we know ourselves. You know what we need before we ask. And you know what is best for us, better than we do ourselves. You know the evil that we have done and the good that we have left undone. You know that at times we have been stubborn and self-centered and selfish and difficult to live with. You know the couldn't care less attitude we so often exhibit in the face of people that truly need us. You know the pretending we do with each other, the masks we wear, the false images we so often project. You know when we are afraid and timid, insecure, doubtful. You know the struggles that confront us, the temptations we wrestle with, the things that irritate us, gnaw at us, that cause us to be anything but confident and sure. You know the hectic pace of living under which we exist, the things we run after, the things we run from, the tensions that pull us apart, keep us from being your whole persons, that rob life of peace and joy which you intend for us. Oh, Lord God, what shall we say when we talk to you? <clears throat> Truly, you do know us better than we know ourselves. I guess the best thing we can do is simply thank you for knowing us, for knowing our feeble frame, for knowing our life, our world, our circumstances. And we thank you that even after knowing us so completely, you still abide with us, showing us mercy and kindness, offering us support and guidance, providing us with hope and peace and joy. Oh God, we trust you. Grant us wisdom and courage for the living of our days. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, we trust you. May your life and your teachings instruct and inspire us to nobler, trusting lifestyles. O oh Holy Spirit, we trust you. Much we need your tender daily care. Fill now, O oh God, with your presence and power loved ones and friends that we lift up before you at this time, those who suffer your presence and your need for your presence and power. We pray for Alice's friend, Vernon A. Duke, still suffering from an automobile accident in late January. 
She awaits surgery for a vertebrae in her spine. Alice Craig. Others that we name to you in the silence of our hearts right now. Loving Father, we thank you for knowing us and our friends and our needs so very well and for making us aware of our need of you. Be with us and our loved ones this day and all our days. We trust our lives completely to your providential wisdom and care. Amen. And now with the confidence of God's children, we are bold to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Give to the wind thy fears, hope, and be not dismayed. God hears thy cries and counts thy tears. God shall lift up thy head. Hymn number 815. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.